And we are back with an all new Keep It. I'm Ira Madison III, and I'm dead and loving it. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I'm Louis Bertel, and I am not deathly sick. So I'm going to hold this podcast together using whatever it is I bring to the podcast and do it consistently. But Ira is basically near death. And uh, yeah. uh, what's happening here? It's very, Remember? the coughing is very Tallulah Bankhead at the end of her life. I'm talking about, <laughs> she's had a few hundred thousand cigarettes at this point. Okay, I am backstage at the milk train doesn't run here anymore. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> We're second in this episode in Tennessee Williams so deep. Yeah, <laughs> Which I did see, not with her, obviously. I saw it with... Um, Olympia Dukakis. May she rest. Yeah, yeah. So, bad play, but she's great. Right. Now, I'm sure she had a lot to do in that play. Um, I yeah. also, this is, by the way, the last week I get to call myself just Emmy nominee. I'll soon be a oh, winner we'll find or out. loser. Yes. Um, I want to give a shout out to Jeopardy, that won Best Game Show over the weekend. I am wearing a Wheel of Fortune shirt today to prove mm. that I'm verse. And then, secondly, <laughs> Ryan Seacrest is now hosting the show. Um, he did his first episode the other day. And can I tell you something? Is there more of a machine in show business than Ryan Seacrest? There, I, I mean, like, we talk about, like, Taylor Swift or Beyonce being machine-like and their ability to keep producing stuff. Ryan Seacrest has never been incapable of doing what he... Like, he's so... It's like he's been hosting for 100 years. It's such a weird quality to have, to, that he feels so belonging to whatever environment he puts himself in work-wise. And by the way, he has 175 jobs still. Yeah. I mean, he ate Brian Dunkelman in the womb. <laughs> and there was lots of frosted tips involved there. So it was a really coarse <laughs> swallow. Yeah, That has to be one of the biggest fumbles ever, by the way. Can you imagine? Like, it's whatever. All... His contract negotiations between season one and season two, and then the show just takes off. Right. It's also one of those shows, though, where they did have, like, two or three too many moving parts at the time. Like, something probably had to go, you know, um, to get to that really insightful analysis that Paula Abdul would bring every single performance. Speaking of American Idol, I have an essay about American Idol in my new book, which is finally coming out after Oof. years of me talking about it. As you know, I'm anti-book, so this is a tough moment for me. But um, <laughs> yes, I'm excited to read it. What is the essay pertaining to? Is it about a specific idol? Yeah, so I wrote um, about the episode where Jennifer C. Hudson goes home. Oh, my God. Well, the – oh, I mean, we were just talking about classic theater. The way yeah. Fantasia throws her head back and sobs, fully <laughs> Medea level. Yeah. The way that Ryan Seacrest – does the most diabolical thing ever and puts all the three black women in one group and then puts the others into another group and then asks, I believe, George Huff to join the group that he thinks is the top group of the week. And of course he goes over to the group where, you know, <laughs> Fantasia and Jennifer Hudson are there. And then Ryan goes, I said the top group. And then the music and the dramatics. Uh, <laughs> but no, I compare that to the other big election of 2004, which was George W. Bush or whatever. Remember him? Um, not you getting into political analysis. Not you writing for Politico. I am just not sure about that. Anyway, the book, the book is now available for pre-order. And it's called Pure Innocent Fun. So go look it up on Amazon. It's on sale on Amazon or wherever you buy your books. I'm going to so. say lots of other places besides Amazon. Just saying. That's all I'm saying. I, I feel like one of the Pod Save Boys now promoting a book. Isn't that oh, all they yeah. do on their right. show? Promote books? Mm -hmm. They're helping people or whatever. <laughs> I think it's stupid. <laughs> Speaking of which, Survivor we're coming up next. on one... Yeah, I'm going to say we're coming up on the advent of John Lovett on Survivor. And I have to tell you, when people come up to me and ask, like, oh, do you know anything about how he did on Survivor? First of all, of course I don't. And second of all, I have no guess as to how this man did. I just, I don't yeah. know. How his, his, his brand of kind of sarcasm and casual, droll intelligence or whatever, I don't really know how that plays on Survivor. Like, he would be an unusual person to win in that regard, I think. Like, you know, like, I feel like it, they're more kind of diabolical, saucy personalities that land on top. 
but I don't know. And I've only known John Lovett in the context of wanting a job from him and working at his company. So sure. um, my affinity for him might be different from being on an island with him. You really sounded fearful when you said that. Okay, interesting. Yeah. yeah. You know, uh, I, I don't know how it'll play. I'm hoping, I feel like for his sake, he probably either wants to win or a somewhat early boot, not that early, but I don't know. Is jury, I feel like jury is probably better on Survivor than it is on Big Brother. Some people like don't want to make the jury. In Big Brother, they put you in like this house that has just a couple of coloring books in it and you have to sit in there for weeks and weeks. It is full prison. Like, and you have to wait until this episode where you are in, basically an inconsequential member of the TV show and you vote one person to win Ultimately, I will also say about John Lovett, I will be on Love It or Leave It, uh, or taping Love It or Leave It live this Thursday with some, I'm looking at my notes, up and coming actress named Jane Fonda. I don't know what this woman is performing. If she's good, if she has training, I have no idea. If she's related to anybody famous. Um, and somebody, the other queen of cinema, Zachary Quinto, will be there. And Kumail Nanjiani, who guest hosted Kimmel over the summer, he will be there too. And I want to say, for a straight man, nobody has looked more like gay porn than this man. This is the gay porniest <laughs> looking man I have ever seen. The shoulder width alone. You know what? Um, he really did do a whole transformation post Marvel. Um, no, w w the Eternals. The Eternal is areola size because his pecs are huge. You know what? We got a few good things out of the Eternals, not the movie, right? But no. we got that. There was Gemma Chan, Kit Harrington, just two beautiful people in a movie being beautiful. Not much else going on. Which is what we request of them. Thank you. Oh, Angelina Jolie is in the movie, of that's course. That's a problem. When, when Angelina Jolie comes up fourth when describing a movie, that's where you know you went wrong. That's when Chloe Zhao should have taken a look inward. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, though, the rumors that Maria might be bad seem to be going away people love it at, at least she seems qualified they for love a nomination her. it seems like yeah which which is love all we her need. back in an oscars conversation yes that's very exciting anything else happening well there were so many things happened since we were last on two weeks ago we'll get into some of it remember that movie the deliverance remember yeah uh, I, I i have a certain limited <laughs> series that's going to be in my keep it this week uh but otherwise <laughs> <laughs> this episode, we've got, we're going to talk about Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice, which I saw and Ira didn't, because as you can hear, he has some sort of Grey's Anatomy level illness. Like, like <coughs> Izzy is I'm trying to have sex with him in the bed. That's how, that's how sick he is. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm Beetlejuice now, actually. I'm dead. Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, we'll talk about that. And then also, James Earl Jones, one of the great actors in any medium, passed away this week. And we will talk about how fabulous he is. And also, we will talk about how he's kind of an honorary EGOT winner. Uh, he won an honorary Oscar, but won the other three uh, uh, awards cleanly. Pasek and Paul, the songwriters, are newly minted EGOT winners this week. So we'll break down maybe our favorite EGOT winners, who deserves an EGOT, which ones are kind of full of shit. Actually, it's going to get nasty. I'm so sorry. It's going to be so mean to some of these people. <laughs> but anyway, that's Keep It This Week. Until, of course, Ira passes away. So the end, the episode could end early. We will be back <laughs> after this. Okay, so Beetlejuice Beetlejuice came out this weekend. Obviously, I was not going to go to the theater and infect people with whatever it is I have. That does sound like an M. Night Shyamalan movie I would see, but go ahead. <laughs> Trap 2. Yeah, right. Except Which yeah. I still haven't seen the first trap. I still haven't I, seen trap. I'm still getting over that M. Night Shyamalan just had his effing daughter play a pop star in the movie and then it's styled <laughs> around her song. It's so brazen. It's so brazen. <laughs> and yet Francis Ford Coppola couldn't even accomplish that much in The Godfather Three. No, right. But that was well, that pertains to Winona Ryder, who was supposed to take that role and then dropped out, and then Sophia got into it. Winona's coming up later with Beetlejuice. Get back on track. What's happening? <laughs> so I did not see it. However, I, I am a big fan of the original Beetlejuice, and uh, I guess this is you convincing me to see it or not see it. And I will say, though, speaking of the original Beetlejuice, do you recall that Roger Ebert did not like this movie? Nothing 
pleases me more than when one of those two <laughs> gentlemen, and they are the the bitchiest straight men who ever lived, and I'm I, I, I like literally like Trump is third, like they're one and two. Details um, magazine staff members, that's yes. straight men who are bitches. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it always like thrills me to realize they hate something completely random, like uh, Gene Siskel famously hating Silence of the Lambs, for example. It's just what it's it's so strange. But Ebert hated it because he loved the story in the beginning. And then when they died, he didn't know it was a ghost story. And he said, I'm not interested in this. He thought it was just going to be a funny comedy about this couple trying to fix up this old house. He, he actually says in uh, his review, I thought it was going to be like Money Pit. <laughs> <laughs> that movie we need to keep watching and talking about. <laughs> Isn't it weird, by the way, that the speaking of Tom Hanks movies, that The Burbs is coming back with Kiki Palmer? It's such a strange choice from the past to bring back. But anyway, um, so this uh beetlejuice beetlejuice i will say this first of all when it comes to like rebooting ip that's like this old uh, for me almost automatically the bar that's set is it cannot be any higher than a two and a half star movie i just like for example watching top gun maverick i can't divorce myself from the movie machinery that is making this happen that feels ultimately kind of cynical um and so i can't think of a movie like that that hasn't that, that has risen above that for me. And I'm going to say the same thing about Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice. That said, it is a full two and a half stars to me, and I will tell you why. First of all, you get a lot of Winona Ryder in this movie. Now, if you've listened a lot to Keep It, I actually have been kind of a doubter of hers. I think I, I, I love her and Heathers, even though I don't love that movie. I um, think she's fine in The Age of Innocence. I think other people kind of could have played that part for which she was nominated for an Oscar. But in this movie, she really brings her signature blend of, one, the, 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 the cynicism that we associate with Lydia Dietz that she played in the original. And true, two, that feeling of that Winona Ryder thing of she seems confounded by literally everything. Like everything sort of is hitting her in pinpricks and needles all the time. And she's a little bit perturbed and strange. She, to me, is downright lovable in this movie. It is a great return to form for her. Uh, uh, and I have to say also about her, she's been giving so many interviews recently. This is one of the most hardcore movie lovers of any major star we have. Like, this is somebody who should be hosting her own TCM channel. I saw her rhapsodizing about uh, Barbara Stanwyck recently. Uh, she's one of the few people who really nailed that letterbox four favorite movies thing, which whenever I see Oh, it, absolutely. But they're all brilliant. A modern romance, obviously. Uh, and this is a Japanese film, Afterlife. That had a huge impact on me. When, when, whenever I see like somebody we really care about step up to the mic for this thing, I absolutely brace myself. Because let me just say something. Amy Adams, baby, you are on notice. This woman comes to the mic and she says her fav her favorite two of her favorite movies are The Shawshank Redemption and Forrest Gump. Ma'am, are you a nine-year-old boy? What happens? <laughs> And like these people, okay, again, some people don't like ranking things. You know, it's like a kind of frame of mind about movies that some people don't have. You cannot, it, it just can't be the Shawshank Redemption anymore. And then also she said St. Elmo's Fire. That movie blows. Yeah, it's a really bad movie. Maybe she's a Mayor Winningham fan, in which case, all right, now I'm crossing the aisle. Now we're friends. Nothing else in that movie is that good, though. You know, I really appreciated... Winona Ryder's letterboxed uh, and and Jenna Ortega's as well. I think that Winona Jesus Christ, Jenna Ortega's like a freak. I, I yes. had no idea she cared about movies this much. Yeah. Specifically gave an interview Winona did where she talked about how she's worked with people who don't even watch movies. She's clearly talking about Millie Bobby Brown and <laughs> how much she loved Jenna Ortega just talking about movies with her. And I also loved seeing them on the red carpet. Like Jenna seemed to really take on a sort of protector role of Winona, like dealing with the press and things like that. There's this lovely clip where the people are screaming at Winona, like a photo without the sunglasses, without the sunglasses. And then you see Jenna lean in and tell her, you don't have to do that. Fuck yeah. No, I mean, Jenna, Jenna does seem like a hardened pro. Like, I'll tell you how to treat these fucking animals or whatever. Everything she said about quote unquote writing for Wednesday seems to be fucking true because she gave an interview about how Tim Burton was coming to her asking her for story ideas for season two, etc. And then handed her the Beetlejuice Beetlejuice script and said, I want you in this. So it seems like he at least 
covets her opinion. Also, um, I was heartened to hear that in, in Winona in doing an interview about her entire career and she revisited the original Beetlejuice, talked about how she loved working in that movie because she felt like an actual collaborator. So it sounds mm. to me like Tim Burton just values the opinion of his actors in a, a really interesting way. I want to also say about Roger Ebert, he did end up loving his movie, Ed Wood, which I think is probably still the mm. best Tim Burton movie if people haven't seen that yet with um, Johnny Depp as... Um, Heard of him. Yes, right. Uh, uh, the world's worst director, Ed Wood, and Martin Landau playing Bella Lugosi uh, to an Oscar win. I also fucking love Sarah Jessica Parker in that movie and Patricia Arquette. Moving on. Isn't it so weird, Jenna Ortega being this big movie buff and then the current Scream movie sort of being what they are? Yeah, I also don't feel like... I'm not positive we're using Jenna Ortega correctly. It's she, we're not. She, she's supposed to be like this, have this cynical edge to her all the time. I'm like, are we sure she just doesn't have dark hair? Like, it's like we're, we're, we're putting this personality on here that I don't think is really true to her. I don't know. Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice. I will say there's a lot of setup for this movie, but once it gets into the groove and you're in the world of the kookiness and you've got a stitched up Monica Bellucci walking around. By the way, that's a relationship we're not talking about enough. Tim Burton and Monica Bellucci. I'm enjoying. You know, I mean, she's Helena Bonham Carter shaped. It makes sense. Those two. And then... uh I really liked, there's this moment in the movie where Jenna Ortega is taken in by this uh, boy character who, of course, turns out to be, uh, I'm sorry, this is a spoiler, a dead person, and he can't leave his treehouse, same rules as in the original uh, Beetlejuice. He is the grandson of the actor Tom Conti, who is an Oscar nominee for uh, a movie called Ruben Ruben in the 80s. So a surprising Nepo baby, but also at least you made it interesting. Um, Elsewhere in Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice, there are some references in this movie that are so Animaniacs level strange and goofy and like things that like Gen Z wouldn't know about. I loved how squarely aimed at Gen X it was. Um, this is a bit of a spoiler, but there's a, uh, a mode of transportation where the dead ride and they call it the soul train. And all the people getting onto it are like soul train dancers. Like they're literally dancing and like, you know, like going down the soul, like Jody Watley. Rosie like Perez? Soul, Rosie Perez, the very same. They're, and <laughs> it, the music is really good. Um, uh, so I'm giving it as full a recommendation as I can for something that does feel like a, a machine spat it out and AI handed it to you. You know, Tim Burton had an interview where he said that it feels like he had lost himself a bit and now he's finally gotten back to who he was with this film. Would you say you're noticing a bit more of the Tim Burton juice coming back? Yes. Well, the movie does make me laugh several times too. Um, I will, uh, Beetlejuice himself, Michael Keaton, nailing the line deliveries in a way where it feels like no time has passed. And I mean, because of the makeup on this character, it's like you're still watching the 1988 Michael Keaton. Like he's still as spry and like the movements are the same as, um, jolty and strange and you know he, he makes the movie what it is that said not quite enough beetlejuice and i know that in the original movie it's not like he dominates the movie you know he he appears when he appears and then you know the other characters take over would have liked a little bit more of him ultimately i think i think michael keaton specifically wanted there to be less of him because he didn't want beetlejuice to overtake the movie but i don't know i feel like michael keaton is having such a great moment in his career that I really didn't know how much I loved him until recently. And it's it's from fun, goofy roles, too, that you think wouldn't be great. But even when he appeared in, say, Spider-Man as the Vulture, right? You know, this sort of pathos that he brought to a character like that. And, it you know, it relies on the fact that, you know, he was in Batman before and that, you know, he did Birdman, etc. So, I don't know. He's such He takes really good roles lately i also feel like over the past few years like this admiration is kicked up for him where he could win like a kennedy center honors or something like there's this agreed upon feeling that he is essential to show business and he has done anything and everything i mean this is the man who starred in like multiplicity um and uh the, the yeah batman etc just uh i you know it was a good movie that um uh, mcdonald's movie the founder that was good underrated movie that didn't go anywhere that oscar season also, he's fantastic in Jackie Brown. Of course. I mean, actually, when people don't pick Jackie Brown as their favorite Quentin Tarantino movie, I have to ask why. I, it just, to me, has everything in, in a way that isn't contrived. Like, he, Quentin Tarantino, I'm not used to his tricks by that point. And that point in his career, it's so, it, it's thrilling. It's peak thrilling Tarantino for me. 
Also, Justin Thoreau plays a part that I almost worried was too over the top. He does get a lot of laughs by the end. And then also, Willem Dafoe plays a certain zany comic role to the hilt. That said, can someone please pick up this man from Nightmare Alley? He's been there for five years now. I'm telling you, it's still poor things. It's still <laughs> one of my eyes is popping out of its socket and the other one is shooting a gun. Like everything about him is still kooky house of waxy. And I would like him to return a little bit to the solemn awards circuit where he belongs. And I'm talking about playing Vincent Van Gogh or the platoon or whatever. I need a little bit more of that Willem Dafoe, lighthouse Willem Dafoe. Yeah, I would say also, it's funny you brought up Justin Thoreau because I was re-watching, for some reason, Big Brother 14. I Fantastic remember which, season. Is that Rachel the Riley? Coaches. No. The no, coaches. The coaches. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yes, Ian Terry. Ian Terry. Yes, Ian Terry, yes. Ian Terry winning. And at one point, Julie asked them about things that have happened in the real world and whether they're true or false. And one of the questions was, who got engaged this week? Was it... Jennifer Aniston or Jennifer Lopez? I didn't realize they played like Us Weekly style games with the contestants, or I had forgotten they did once upon a time. I think they do less of that now, but they really used to do that shit where it was, oh, people care about these things. And they would ask about the the Super Bowl, etc. cetera. Um, but it was Jennifer Aniston just getting engaged to Justin Thoreau. Oh my God, simpler times. I did enjoy them together. Also, he's quite talented. He wrote Tropic Thunder. Yeah, when people have no. a script in their in their belt. That's always strange. You know, like uh, what's his name? Glenn Powell is one of those now. You know. Yeah, and also, and also the black Channing Tatum, um, the one from Prison Break. Oh, you're talking about Wentworth Miller. Yes, because he wrote Stoker. Which is crazy. What? Yeah. P- people contain multitudes. P- consult Walt Whitman on this. This is what he. But thinks. then when they do that, I'm always like, okay, do you? Was that the only script you had in you, and and we're grateful that that's all you want to put out there, or is there something else percolating and no one's just asked you for it? No, I keep thinking about when we had Denai Guerrera on this show, and she mm-hmm. is of course she is a playwright and a uh, Tony nominated playwright, I believe. Yeah, and she said, "Well, I wasn't getting the roles I wanted for myself, so I had to write something." And I I assume that's why. A, a large sw- swath of actors write, you know, they're not getting cast, and so they think well, this yeah. is an interesting. Ryan Reynolds, put me, yes, Ryan- and Blake Lively. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody's casting Blake Lively. They're too scared, too big of a risk. That girl is very lucky. A simple favor two is coming out next year. You, right, which I okay. assume people, that will get people back into her favor, if you know what I'm saying. <laughs> and we're back with our favorite segment of the episode. I'm almost done coughing in your ears. <laughs> How many people have turned this episode off? <laughs> no, they said, wow, this is a gag being played on me or something. They don't even believe you're sick. Lewis, what's your keep it? My keep it is to something I really thought I was going to enjoy in a uh, salacious way more than I did. The limited series, The Perfect Couple. Nicole Kidman has only done this to me a couple times where she takes a really high profile project and I guess character and doesn't deliver something deeper and more interesting. I'm thinking, of course, about that Aquaman shit where she made me sit and watch. <laughs> Girl, no. It's Both like of when them? Kate Blan- it's like when Kate Blanchett made me see that um, Thor Ragnarok movie, and I'm still the most livid fag who ever lived. Um, now, you didn't call her out about that. Well, we only had limited time. And <laughs> I needed her to like me. That's all I need. You, I think that's understood. Yeah. Um, but... On this show, okay, I understand that in the wake of White Lotus, we want to watch like um, bad people in expensive places or whatever. But I just, I just thought it was a big round of somebody's notes about what they wanted to see in a TV show. Literally those two things. It's kind of star-studded cast. It wasn't about anything. This is a like a six-episode show, like sixty minutes a piece, where we're just waiting for the main character Eve Houston, who seems miserable throughout the show. Um, like getting around all these other characters to figure out who murdered Megan Fahey, who is, I think, maybe the best person on the show. If actually, I'll say this about Perfect Couple, affirmation of Megan Fahey's talents. Looking forward to more of her. Nicole Kibben is this famous author who lives in Nantucket on this wonderful estate. I actually think she was miscast. I needed this character to be a bit pricklier than what she gave. Someone more like a Lori Metcalf. Somebody who you could see them being in charge of like a publishing enterprise, but then also an obvious dark side. I felt like Nicole didn't play the darkness dark enough. And by the way, as we know, 
this is a weirdo woman who can go there on a, in any kind of movie. So I know she was capable of it. Watch To Die For again. We know how dark it gets. But um, so I was just disappointed with this. Uh, D- Dakota Fanning, not bad on it, I guess. It's just if it's going to be this pulpy and this much of an airport book, as it literally was, it's one of those books you buy at the airport, make it a movie. I just don't need it to be a limited series. Yeah, I agree. I watched very little of it before I interviewed her. <laughs> oh, but what did you think of her? I mean, she's I mean, she's fantastic. That that yeah. was such a fantastic interview to be on a Zoom with Nicole Kidman in your Fire Island house bizarro. is truly bizarro. Also, a friend was sitting there working and so he's hearing the entire interview, just mouth agape, and then another friend walked uh through the kitchen to get something. She was like, "Who's that? Have them come join us." And my friend was like, "I I cannot. And then he ran away. <laughs> I, I, I'm sure I brought this up on Keep It before. One time I went to a screening of that movie Destroyer, and I heard she would be there for a Q&A. And then the lights came up and nobody was there. So I went to the lobby, like, upset. And she was just there waiting to hang out with people and speak to them. Excuse yes. me? That was her after the Boy Erased premiere, too. She's just chilling. She loves people. Australians, what is it about them? Why are they so hopeful about the human race? It makes me suspicious. Ira, what is your keep it this week? Okay, my keep it this week goes to... (laughs) I don't even know where to begin. (laughs) But I have been watching The Secret Lives of Mormon Wives on Hulu. What is wrong with you? What is wrong with you? First of all, this show might save reality TV, Lewis. What? Yes. Okay, because... I think that we had gotten to a point where, especially with Real Housewives or something, where we were sick of people just cravenly thirsting for attention but pretending that they're not, right? This is, you already know they're part of Mom Talk, which was this group of women in Salt Lake City who were dancing together on TikTok and talking about their lives and then had a soft swinging scandal. Soft swinging is everything but intercourse. Help me, God. Okay. (laughs) That really Uh, took me a beat. Go ahead. (laughs) So we already know that they are thirsty, you know? They want to be famous. And so, like, they're very blatant about it on this show. And so I think that that helps because these people are so wild. There's this woman, Taylor, who's sort of the ostensible lead, who in the first episode – gets drunk, fights with her new boyfriend, and we cut to body cam footage of her being arrested. And then we cut to 11 months after Taylor's arrest. (laughs) I just want to say keep it to the sad life that her husband, Connor Livett, is enduring on the show. Uh, He had a scandal where apparently he was on Tinder talking to other women, and... I don't want to join the chorus of people online guessing about a man's sexuality, but Mm -hmm. it does not feel like he was on Tinder, for one. (laughs) You don't want to speculate. I don't want to speculate, but... He's getting his Christian tingles elsewhere, you're saying. Watching him on the show, it's it's kind of devastating. I don't know. And maybe I shouldn't feel bad for... It's like awkward. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, maybe I shouldn't feel bad for you know, a man existing in the Mormon universe who's married this woman. But I don't know. The patriarchy, whatever, it's I feel bad for him. Also, yeah. He has more looks than his wife. Literally different hairdos, different outfits. Diana He's giving Ross housewives level. level. Yes. Like yeah. there's he is unrecognizable scene to scene. And I'm like, maybe that and people are speculating that's so that he wouldn't be recognized. While he's on whatever app he's on. But now I'm like, well, you've been put on this show. So now you can't do that without fear of someone talking about what you're doing on an app publicly, right? So he's yeah, essentially right. trapped now. And I feel mm. like that was Whitney's sort of game for this. You know, now you're trapped. Now you can't do whatever you were doing in private before because people will expose it because now you're on TV. Oh, well, that sounds gruesome. Yeah. Yeah. But unfortunately, it does also him. sound compulsively watchable. You kind oh, of yeah, I'm going to keep watching it. In. I think you more successfully sold this to me than I sold Beetlejuice to you. Yes. <laughs> it's it's kind of fantastic. It's just, it's, it's truly. Is it Bravo? From, no, it's Hulu. Oh. It jumps right in. All right. 
I grew up with a couple of Mormons. I they always when when there's like six Mormon siblings in a family, they are always utterly identical. I don't know how Mormons do that. Is it? I I don't want to speculate. I'll go ahead and speculate. Is it incest? Go <laughs> <laughs> family dick. Yeah, I I would love to know. Also, the woman Whitney I was talking about with the husband, she. There was scandal last year because her baby was in the NICU, and she did a TikTok dance in the NICU Help with her me baby. God. What a sight! <laughs> so these people the look on my face want to so be sad. famous desperately. Yeah. I lost control of my limbs. I feel like <laughs> and I can't believe I have to even react to that. It's specifically, you know, those dances where someone's dancing and they're pointing and like the captions come up on the screen because they're answering questions. Those so insane TikTok dances. She's bone, doing that bone over her chilling ones. Yeah. She's doing uh -huh. that over her baby who's resting there in, in ICU. That is so gr Brigham Young doesn't want that. <laughs> Joseph Smith said no. This was a fake ass keep it. I want everybody to watch this show. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'm joining right in. I'm joining yeah. right in. And I'm joining the Tabernacle Choir. <laughs> we'll see you next week and maybe I'll have an Emmy yeah and if not an Emmy maybe a special guest okay 